Hi, I'm Ray Osher of Don't Quit Your Day Job, and I'm this week's guest on Metapod. This is Metapod, where we unpack the web's most interesting podcasts and the stories behind them. Don't Quit Your Day Job, the podcast, is a podcast about the people behind the music that other people wrote, performed, and made millions off of, and their goals to score a little gas money and cover the bar tab. Hi, and welcome to Metapod. Thanks for tuning in, whether you've been here before or this is your first time. This is Wendy, and I've got a new podcast from a veteran broad slash podcaster for you this week, and it's called Don't Quit Your Day Job. Sounds like cautionary advice about something you might fantasize about occasionally, right? Well, Don't Quit Your Day Job is a podcast about and for people in cover bands. You know, bands that play the songs you like at your local bar or neighborhood events and other festive occasions. Bands composed of people who do other things during the day, like teach children, take care of animals, or manage a company's IT infrastructure. People who put their sunglasses on at night and make sure you have a good time out when you're with friends. Don't Quit Your Day Job is hosted by Ray Osher, a radio personality and station manager at WMRC or MyFM 101.3 in Milford, Massachusetts in the United States. Ray has a lot of jobs, and actually, I don't think he'd dream of quitting any of them. He's in a cover band called the Pub Kings, which we will hear about, but he's also one of the voices of New England Legends, a podcast and television series that explores spooky myths of the New England region. Ray is a warm and personable guy, and his new podcast allows people and bands to talk about how they pursue their passion for music and entertaining, while getting all the other stuff in life taken care of, too. The conversations are full of humble advice from experienced and humorous part-time musicians. But Ray and his guests pull back the stage curtain for others, too, giving fans and business owners ideas about how the nighttime entertainment economy works from the cover band perspective. If radio, podcasts, and cover bands haven't intrigued you yet, Ray was named one of the top 50 dads who podcast by Podcast Magazine this year. Another day job I'm sure Ray wouldn't want to quit. Congratulations, Ray. I hope you'll make this list again next year. All right, let's rock. Ray Osher of Don't Quit Your Day Job, thank you for joining me here on Metapod. It's really nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, Wendy. Thanks for having me. I love the idea of doing a podcast about podcasts. That's that's a lot of fun. <laughs> so we're going to talk about Don't Quit Your Day Job. And I'm going to admit that when I first came across this podcast, I was secretly hoping that it might be a sort of spinal tap for audio exploring, you know, some fantasies of an aspiring rock star. And that's not to say that you are not a rock star, Ray, but it's actually different than that, I discovered. I think if you're listening and you continue to listen, there'll be uh, different um, musicians that are on with me that might have some uh, Spinal Tap type stories. Uh, but this is set in reality, and it's all <laughs> about being in a uh, cover band, which is a unique thing, especially a local cover band. Uh, usually you listen to the radio, there's somebody playing their original music and we, we learn about them. However we do, but nobody ever talks about the cover guys playing at the local bar down the street. We're making maybe 50 bucks, hundred bucks each. A lot of that goes to the bar tab and we're playing other people's music and we still have to deal with management and rowdy guests and set lists and songs to play, what songs to play, what not to play. Uh, there's a lot that goes into being in a cover band. And throughout the podcast, we also get to know that person. What's their day job? Could be a lawyer, could be a doctor. And you might be surprised to learn that your favorite local bar musician is, you know, uh, uh, making sure that pets are healthy during the day. Maybe they're a vet. And uh, so we get to know them. And then we talk about the ins and the outs of playing in a cover band. So, yeah, the conversations can be pretty entertaining. But what I have found interesting is that they're quite thoughtful and serious in terms of advice for, 
uh, and I'm going to use air quotes here, part-time or you might say hobby musicians, who else is the show for, would you say? You know, I think it's for everybody because I know a lot of people that enjoy going out and listening to live music. So you don't necessarily have to be a musician to uh, benefit from listening. Um, it's almost like looking in from the outside and uh, and secretly getting a peek through the curtain. Um, I think a lot of people would find that interesting. And, you know, like you said, the conversation can be entertaining depending on the guest. We have some laughs. Uh, but we do throw out a lot of advice too. You might not know what we're dealing with up on stage. So next time you, you know, put a thumbs down because you don't like the song that we're playing, you know, maybe you'll think twice and realize <laughs> that I mean, we we did a lot to get up on stage to entertain you guys. Be nice to us. Oh, I will. <laughs> um, and I, I use the word hobby there in quotes, and I'm I'm aware that hobby is sometimes a word used to belittle something um, that someone does, something that they spend a lot oh. of time or effort or money on and maybe doesn't have the return on investment that other people think it should. Um, indie indie podcasters and people in bands will be very familiar with this, right? And, and <laughs> Ray, I must say, you're a podcaster in a cover band, so that's a double don't <laughs> quit your day job, right? Well, exactly. I mean, I do have a day job. I work in radio. I do social media as well. And this is indeed a hobby. It's great gas money. It's a great excuse to go out with the guys and hang out. Um, you know, we play two or three times a month. I don't golf. So this is indeed my <laughs> right. hobby. Um, but I do have friends that will be out there three, four or five nights a week making money. That's what they do. Even if they're in a cover band or a solo acoustic playing other people's music, um, they're, they're making a living off, off of it. But I would say the mo that most of us are probably, you know, hobbyists when it comes to this. We're not expecting mm -hmm. to make a lot of money, but we're having fun doing it. I'm 50 years old. I play with guys that are between 40 and 60 years old. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's, for the most part, it's a hobby. There's, there's nothing wrong with that word at all. Okay. What's it been like explaining the podcast to people and getting guests on the show? I mean, obviously the people you've had on the show probably get it, but have you had any other interesting run-ins with people explaining what the show's about? Well, so far, everyone that I've had on have been friends of mine, and I think that's why it was so easy to start this podcast. I have mm -hmm. a pool of friends that I can get this thing off the ground with. So getting people involved wasn't difficult at all. I just spoke to a guy that I only talked to. I didn't really know him that well, and we've only spoken on Facebook a couple times. So he came down to my man town where I do my show, and it was nice getting to know him. Um, and then at the same time, nice hanging out with my friends over a beer, doing the podcast, giving advice. Um, so it hasn't been difficult getting anyone yet. I am afraid that the uh, well will dry up sooner, <laughs> sooner okay. or later. And we'll see what happens then. But there's plenty of people to talk to. We we have a very rich uh, music scene in my local area. And I have many friends over the last 10 or 12 years that I've met that I can always turn to. And it sounds like you've gone hyper local to start with a range of supporters as well. Like you have some local bars and uh, live music venues supporting the show. And may I just give a shout out to my people in the 603, because I noticed that you are supported by the Looney Bin in Laconia, yeah. New Hampshire. Go Looney yeah. Bin and hello, Aunt Kathy. <laughs> you know folks up there. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I know Michelle and I've, my band has played up there a few times. And oddly enough, a lot of bands from my local uh, area play there, especially okay. during Bike Week. So yeah. I remember that at one point, I'm looking at all the bands that are playing throughout Bike Week a few years ago. Half of them were from my area and the other half were from other places. So for some reason, that's a big uh, vacation destination from yeah. the Milford area. Uh, so I asked Michelle, she was happy to support and all my supporters, you know, were very kind enough to get behind this podcast. And uh, yeah, I feel very lucky and blessed that I have a lot of support on this. Yeah, that's great. I mean, why should bars and venues support local talent? And what's the advantage of them doing that on a podcast? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm getting their name out. And even if 30 people are listening and two go to that restaurant for the weekend, you know, everyone's making out. But it is uber local, like you said. Uh, but I really think that anybody who's in a cover band anywhere in the world goes through the same 
things that we're going through in my Uber local area here. So hopefully we're giving, we're local, we're right here, but we're giving the same advice to somebody who needs it in, uh, you know, Austin, Texas or any place in the world, really. Do you think you might speak with folks outside of New England at some point? I think, yeah, I think once the it gets rolling and word gets out and more people are listening, then I, I would love to do a Zoom like conversation like this with people from around the world and get maybe some maybe that maybe it is a little different in Ohio. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be a, a great um, uh, a great opportunity to see what else people are doing outside of our area. So, Ray, tell us a bit about your day job and really w under what circumstances would you quit it? <laughs> At this point in my life, I don't think I'd be able to quit it. Um, I don't think uh, music is going to uh, go too far as far as the local thing goes. Um, but my, I work in radio and I run a radio station in Milford, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked in, in your neck of the woods. I've worked in uh, Utah, uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. uh, Cape Cod was where I got my start. And okay. mostly mornings. I, I, I'm an on-air personality, but it, my FM... Uh, 101.3 in Milford, I run the station. So that's okay. my day job. And it's pretty much a 24 seven job. Okay. Yeah. Why, why so? Um, there's always something to do. There's always uh, items to be posted on social media and on, on the website. Um, the station goes off the air and luckily I'm right down the street. I got to go down there and take care of that. Uh, there's production to do, there's promotions. So it's not just, and that's another misconception. It's not just the 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. shift that I do. Mm -hmm. There's uh, many hours in the day that I have to put into my job. And what kind of band are you currently in? Currently, it is an electroacoustic band. And electroacoustic okay. means that it's, um, I don't know if we made that word up. We may have made that up. We have an acoustic guitar, an electric bass, and a e-kit an electronic drum kit. So we are able to play quietly in an acoustic type setting, and then we're able to turn it up when things get rowdy. Okay. Uh, and a lot of venues appreciate that because a full band will come in and just be way too loud, whereas we can turn up and down. Our music is just songs you can sing along to in a bar, at a brewery, songs you know. That's it. We, we don't try to get too fancy. A lot of three chord stuff. Uh, we try to uh, connect with the audience right away and just become one. Where we're all just hanging out at that brewery, and uh, that's it. We're just we're in it to have fun and to make people smile. Do you wear sunglasses on stage? I sometimes do, and I'll tell you why. And that was more with the heavier bands. I was in an '80s band. I was in a grunge band. I did the country thing, but I can't memorize my lyrics anymore. I just there's too <laughs> much going on in my head. So when I have my iPad in front of me, it's easier to have the sunglasses on where they can't see when I have to look down at my iPad. Okay. Yeah. And do you promote the podcast at your own shows? Um, I really haven't had an opportunity to. I'm, sure. My sixth episode is coming up, so it's been six weeks now, and really haven't gigged out too much in the last six weeks, but I probably should do that. I should probably tell anybody who's listening. <laughs> so it, the show is new. Um, what kind of day jobs have you come across in your conversations? And probably you've heard many of these before you even started the show, but what kind kinds of day jobs do people in cover bands typically have or is it all over the board and are there any jobs that are particularly beneficial or maybe detrimental to being in a band working at home is definitely good um okay. i've spoken most it's a lot of it people for some okay. reason and i think that they get to make their own hours so that uh benefits them um one of my friends is a teacher and a coach so that was another profession that we talked about. Uh, but again, the other guys have been mostly IT. I've got a sound and lighting guy that's in my band. Uh, but for the most part, I got a guy that works in finance. Um, and, I'm, and weirdly enough, he's flexible on hours. So we're all pretty flexible uh, with our day jobs where we can make this work. I would say, though, that a nine to five, like a, like a traditional nine to five is probably tough for if you're a bartender and you count on working nights and making tips, mm. that's you don't see too many restaurant folks playing in bands, I think. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I've known a few in my yeah. earlier days, but yeah. I think yeah, uh, you if if you're a bartender, you certainly can play at your own place, so that helps, I suppose. You, right. You always you always have a spot. Yeah. 
Um, and from a different angle, are there any types of bands that are particularly good or bad for someone's day job? Um, <laughs> well, I, w I think it maybe if you're if if the band itself is pretty vulgar, like maybe it's a, it's a <laughs> rap and every word is a is a swear, you might have trouble going to the bank the next day and facing customers. Um, I think you have to be careful about that. Or maybe you've got a, a lot of tattoos and piercings because of your band. That might It might be hard to go to the hospital and uh, or go to the nursing home and take care of old folk. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what I find really interesting about your show, um, and maybe this is because my mom was a bartender and I grew, I grew up in a bar a bit, um, but the discussions that you've had that I've heard so far on the podcast, they connect the band, the audience and the venue, or really the staff at the venue, your guests have been quite reflective on these dynamics and especially the relationship between the band and the staff at the venue. Mm -hmm. And some of these thoughts I recognize from my own experiences, but for people who are not close to this, I think, your conversations reveal that music is business, yes. uh, even when it's local, and how critical relationships are to that business. Really big open question here, but what has social media done to those dynamics between band, audience, and venue? I mean, you are probably old enough to know a time before the internet and what bands Just posters. Did. You'd hang posters <laughs> right. back then. That, that was about it. Um, social media is so important because I think when you when you develop a relationship with a venue, you're advertising that venue. You want them to succeed. So now we're posting on social media, hey, come to Avalina's on Thursday night. And the more you say that, the more it becomes an ad. So even if the person doesn't come to see you, they still are now aware of that venue. So you're mm -hmm. you're you're promoting the venue, not just your your gig. And when somebody comes in and says, Oh, I know there's a band here. They were talking about you guys. I had to come tonight to check it out. It goes a long way. It helps the band get rebooked. Uh, it shows that we're working hard. I mean, the venues are paying us. So and it's not just to play. It's not just those three hours. They're paying us to promote their venue, bring people in, spend money on food and drinks. And if we could do it right, we all make out. You know, the, the, the bar covers our food and beer tab. They pay us well. They they double the pay the next time because it was so successful. Um, the, the, the patrons give you tips. The bartenders are now suggesting to the owner, you have to have this band back. So the relationship is so important. And speaking of bartenders, you want to get on. That's who you want to get on your side right there, right out of the gate. Oh, the yes, owner might not be there at the end of the night, but the bartenders are. And the owner or the manager is going to ask the bartenders, how was the band last night? So you get right on their side. And it's nothing deceiving. I mean, I love getting to know new people. Um, so I always ask what the bartenders' names are. And I make sure that throughout the show, we are shouting out to them. Make sure you take you know, take care of Jillian on your way out. She's been making drinks for you all night. She's been fantastic. Tip her well, that kind of thing. Bobby's mm -hmm. making a great margarita, everybody. You got to try it. <laughs> and they appreciate it. And there's not enough bands that will bring the staff into the show. And I've heard from a lot of staff that they, uh, they, they really do appreciate being a part of it. Mm-hmm. I know I remember from my mom's time as a bartender, she sometimes, and this, this only came out when there was maybe a bad experience with a band and that band's audience, mm -hmm. which may have been not very well behaved. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes you saw this flip, like, well, it's the band's responsibility to control or, you know, there's a relationship there between the band and the audience and their behavior. Have, have you ever seen or felt that? Yeah, or I have. And I think uh, it's, it's up to the band to make sure at the end of the night, I mean, let's just take a, a dive bar, for example, you've got some pretty rowdy people that are already jacked up at 1230 at night. If you're playing till 1230 and you know, everyone's calling for one more song and the bartender saying, no, you got to stop. And then you keep playing because the crowd wanted it. 
you want to calm people down before they go out the door. You don't want to jack them up. You, you don't want to be playing Killing in the Name of from Rage Against the Machine, which we've done plenty of times. And it just it's not a good idea. At the end, <laughs> you, you really want to be ramping things down a bit some, to make sure everyone gets out of the place safely. And so that the bartenders can go home at a, at a decent time. And uh, again, it's it's all about that relationship with the venue. Um, you have to put yourself in their shoes as much as you want to keep playing all night, as much as you want to keep playing the heaviest stuff you can play because the crowd is reacting to it. You have to think about the uh, the eventual outcome of your decisions. And you, you just don't want to jack people up too much at 1 a.m. Do you think your fans would be surprised to hear that this is how you think of dynamics? Or? Not my fans, because all my fans are 30, 40, 50, 60 years old. We have, we're on the the older side. We're playing a lot of John Cougar and Bruce Springsteen and mm -hmm. songs, songs from the 70s and 80s and a couple 90s. So we're not too worried about that. And when we play breweries, now we're playing, before COVID, everyone was playing till 12, 30, 1 o'clock. But now the, the, uh, the average set time is 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, so it's not a late night thing anymore, at least in my local area. And I, I like that because I'm getting old. I don't want to be coming home at 2.30 in the morning. So, yeah, I don't think anybody would be too surprised. It's, you know, there, there's room for rowdiness. Don't get me wrong. And I, I, you know, I've been in the crowd. I've been playing on the stage in a situation like that. I think you just have to be aware of your audience. Um, if you know people in the audience and you know they're acting up, then I think there's nothing wrong with the band taking that person aside saying, listen, I love you, bro. And I know you're at every show, but can you just calm down just a little bit? Because right. the owner's the owner's sitting in the corner staring at you and he's pretty upset with us because we he knows that we brought you here. So yeah. there's nothing wrong with communication, I think. And it sounds like you're of the opinion that, you know, the band works together with the venue to sell um, drinks, Absolutely. food, booze. In Europe, it seems that more venues are demanding a cut of what the band sells in merchandise. And I'm wondering if this is the case in your region or maybe if you know more broadly in the U.S. And what do you think of it? Does the venue have a right to a cut of merch sales? I suppose it. Well, if they're taking a cut of the sales, they're probably not paying the band well either. Um, I don't. I don't think that's fair. I think a, a band, well, again, a lot of people think we're just on stage for three hours and that's it. They don't uh, tack on the the uh, the practice time and the money we spent on equipment and promotions and all that. So a lot of money and a lot of time goes into what we do for a three-hour period. Um, so any extra money we can make, a tip jar selling merch, I believe should go right to the band. We make money. We're not hurting the venue by doing that. It's the same with a uh, with a cover charge. Like a, a a a venue will charge ten bucks at the door and give the band three dollars of that. You're gonna make your money if we're doing our job right. You're gonna make money off of the bar, and you're gonna make a lot of money off of the bar. That's what a band is for: keep people there, eating and drinking. So I don't think you need to be taking any more money away from from the band. Mm. I think I heard a discussion with a guest. Carolyn, Caroline, Carolyn, sure. Carolyn okay. Ray from Carolyn Ray and the Rumors. Okay. She had mentioned something about, uh, and I'm really probably summarizing roughly here, uh, classic rock's suitability for cover bands versus, say, a synth-driven band or songs. Mm. Do you agree with that? Or can you, can you talk a little bit more about that? Is, are certain genres better for cover bands? Well, I think right now classic rock is pretty, pretty common. So you want to be careful not to be too common because if every every band's doing classic rock, you're not setting yourself apart. Mm -hmm. uh, a few years back, I started a band called Abe Froman, uh, the Abe Froman Project, was which was an '80s band, and we dressed up and we wore the stuff. We had synth, we had a, a keyboard on stage, and that was specific to '80s pop music. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the more specific you can get without going too deep into a catalog of one's work um the better so all 80s one hit wonders we all know them we all know the safety dance we all know mickey <laughs> we all know those songs that's gonna kill somewhere but if you're playing b-sides from emerson lake and powell you know they uh, uh, nobody you'll, you'll have a few people there but the, the <laughs> goal is to 
to to to fill the room. So you're not doing yourself any service by uh, playing music that you want to play. It's all about the the crowd. You have to think about what's the most common song. I fought Wagon Wheel for the longest time, and then somebody requested it one night, and we were doing a duo show. And we're like, let's just do it. So we did it and the place went nuts. And then we played it later that night again, because it was requested again and it hasn't left our set list since. And it's just (laughs) one of those songs that's overplayed, but everybody loves it. I think I also heard you mention a audience or fan member um, who got annoyed with you because you didn't sound like (laughs) Axl Rose. So, you know, what, what, um, what other funny stories do you have? I mean, anyone who's been in a band has some of these stories about the assholes and the weird stuff that they do and say, so what do you got for us? Well, that, that was, um, it's annoying and I, I've learned to brush it off, but there was a woman in the front of the, the stage with her arms folded, shaking her head. No, as I'm trying to, I brought sweet child of mine down a, a, a step and I just couldn't sing the high part and neither can Axl Rose these days. <laughs> And I just looked at her and I said, listen, I'm getting like $75 tonight. Axl Rose in in 1989 was making millions of dollars. Um, So I can't sound exactly like the people that you're listening to on the radio. And those people don't sound like they do. I'm pretty proud of myself that I can do Poison. I can do Brett Michaels. And even he comes down a step or two when he's singing. That whole band doesn't sound like they did 30 years ago. But I can keep up with him at 50 years old. So I'm pretty proud of that. Um, but it's it's nearly impossible. And some people expect you to be just like the song, just like the original song. So that happens a lot. That's probably the well, that, that's not a silly story. That's that's an annoying story. Probably just you know what? I, I tend to do this. Sometimes I'll sing the same verse over and over again because I forgot that I just did the first <laughs> verse or I start with the second verse and then go into the first verse. Um, that happens a lot. I think my my screw ups are always um, entertaining, and it's it's the band. We it's somebody somebody messes up a chord or a note, and they go into something else, and we just laugh it off. A lot of people would get upset about it, but it's become part of our shtick, where we let the audience know, oh yeah, we just screwed up, and we know it, and we're not going to let you call us on it before we call ourselves out on it. Before you accept a gig. I think this is a, something I also heard in one of your conversations. Like, how do you judge whether to do it or not? And this particular conversation I thought was quite funny because I think you were describing who was organizing the event. And I think it was probably women in their mid 50s. And I think mm. you had a clear idea about what that kind of crowd wants and what happens with that kind of crowd. And that's happen to be exactly what I think usually happens with that crowd. It's, you know, wild dancing and just complete losing it on the stage or the <laughs> dance floor um, yeah. with, you know, songs from your youth. What are the funny, funnest kind of audiences or gigs to play and, and what are the worst? It's the, it's the other age of the, I mean, the other end of the age spectrum. It is women in their forties and fifties. Um, I grew up in the eighties, so I know I can connect with somebody by playing, um, uh, Africa or, or dr- a jump from Van Halen. And I know every, it's going to bring people back to their youth. And I also like playing for an older crowd because they have money. They have disposable income that they can spend at the place. They don't mind if they drop two, three hundred dollars at a restaurant or a bar or a brewery if they're being entertained and having a good night. Um, So that's that's who I like playing for Um, playing for kids. I mean, they show up to the venues drunk already, so they're not spending any money and they're, you know, a little judgmental. And maybe that's just my age talking. Uh, but I do, I love playing breweries because we have a built-in crowd and they're always there for a good time. And we have a lot of great local breweries in this area, but usually I will scope out the venue. And luckily we have a lot of friends here that play places and that's how we can judge. Like they had a great night. Oh, I'll try to get a gig there, but I'll scope the place. out. I'll look at their Facebook page. I'll see what kind of bands they have. I also book bands and there's nothing worse than somebody saying, can I bring my 10 piece in? We'd love to play there. We, we love your place. Well, our place only fits like maybe two acoustic guys where did you think you were gonna come in because some people just throw out blanket emails to bars they just want to play anywhere Mm. but i make sure that it's the right room for us um pictures of smiling people 
people in the age group that we really want to connect with. Um, but there's a lot that goes into choosing the right venue. Okay. Would being in a band be as fun if it was your day job? I don't know. That's a good question because I love what I do. I don't know if I could do it every single night. Um, and I know people that that do it. And if you're an original band, you're trying to make it, you're on the road, you're, you're, you're playing the same songs, the same 10 songs every night. Um, I like what I do. So maybe if I was working in a nine to five job that I couldn't stand, maybe I'd uh, be working a little bit harder on the music side of it to see if I can make extra money to do that. But I love radio and it's, it's a form of entertaining. So I'm, I'm entertaining during the day and I'm entertaining at night. So it's uh it's a nice mix. Yeah. How do you, I, I how do you fuel do you that? that? Dunkin' Donuts? <laughs> yeah. Dunkin' Donuts. Um, you know, we, we, we have a few pops when we're playing. Um, but that's it. I mean, I guess if I was to, if this was 25 years ago, I'd say cocaine, but that's, <laughs> that's, that's not how the dads roll these days. Uh, so it's coffee before the gig and it's, um, you know, a little whiskey shop before you go just to get the blood going. And, uh, and it, honestly, it's the interaction from the crowd that, that spikes the adrenaline. Um, mm. I mean, you can, it's, it's a, it's a weird feeling. Nobody's dancing. You're performing. You're like, what are we doing here? And you don't have a lot of energy. Two people come up and start dancing. And all of a sudden the switch goes off and you can feel you, you've got more energy coming out. Then more people come out before you know it. You're high on that. Mm -hmm. It's very cool. Speaking of dads, I read that you made the top 50 dads who podcast list. Is that true? Yeah. I did. That's cool. That's my other podcast that I've been doing with Jeff Belanger, who is a, a writer for uh, Ghost Adventures on the Travel Channel. And he's written tons of books and we've known each other for years. And he said, let's do a podcast. So we do a podcast called New England Legends. And it's okay. uh, like a 12 to 20 minute episode each week, just talking about uh, different myths and, and folklore and uh, based in New England. It's scripted. There's sound effects. We cool. take you on a little trip. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. So we made uh, Podcast Magazine's Top 50 Dads. Number two, by the way. We were at number two. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it, it was fun. And while well, it's Halloween this when we're recording this now, and that's a, that's a fun time of year in New England. Oh, so. yeah. Absolutely. We'll have our Halloween episode coming out the Thursday before Halloween. Ooh, that's always good. fun. It's a little, little special extra spookiness for you. So is there anything coming up for you and the podcast that Metapod listeners might be interested to know about? Um, I would just ask everybody to give it a listen. I, I have nothing special. I mean, maybe we'll get to a point where I take the show on the road and we, we do it from a venue with a band playing in the background, but then you're dealing with music rights and all that stuff. Um, but I, I wouldn't mind sitting at a booth with a band that's about to go on and interview them. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'd love to take it on the road or take it to some of the, take it up to the loony bin, you know, do it from yeah, there. There you go. Um, we've got a, a brewery in town, Rushford and Sons that, um, that we could do it from there. Yeah. I maybe just take it on the road, but for now it's, it's just week by week. And I would really be interested in a bartender's episode. Oh, that's actually a good idea. Look at that side of it. Maybe talk to some owners and managers. And yeah. I think I can get to that point where now we're talking to people who support local music, not just the musicians, but the people who support. Right. I like it. Yeah. Well, Ray, thank you so much for coming on Metapod. I'm definitely not going to quit my day job. <laughs> and it's what been- What do you do, by the way? What's your day job? <laughs> my day job is um, in the travel industry, working for a trade association. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that's fun. I, I definitely need a night job. That's why I'm a podcaster. <laughs> I've been picking up. I have other ideas for podcasts too. It's this is a fun way to make some extra money if you can get your shows sponsored. And I've been lucky enough to do that. I don't know how long it'll last, though. You know, when when it comes to re up, we'll see how the uh, the sponsors feel. But yeah. I was pretty good going out of the gate. Good. Well, it's been wicked fun to talk to you on Metapod. Thank you so much. It was great to be here. Thanks again to Ray for taking the time to talk to me about his new podcast, Don't Quit Your Day Job. I don't know where he finds the time and energy, but I think it's inspiring. If you'd like to follow Ray or his cover band on social media, 
You can find Ray on Twitter at the Ray Osher, and that's spelled T H E R A Y A U G E R. And you can find the Pub Kings on Instagram at the Pub Kings. As always, you can follow Metapod on social for more details on the guests and podcasts featured on the show. Metapod is on Twitter at the Metapod Show and Instagram and Facebook at Metapod Show. Thank you for listening. See you. Thanks for listening to Metapod. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at The Metapod Show and subscribe at any of the usual places you find your other favourite podcasts. You can follow Metapod on Instagram at Metapod Show or visit our website, metapodshow.com. This episode of Metapod was recorded, edited and produced by me, Wendy Morrill.